You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down the threats and vulnerabilities, solving some of the hard problems and protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. We have two primary research teams at Reversing Labs. One of them focuses on destructive malware and the other focuses on open source uh, and the attacks we see leveraging open source as, as a vector. And in looking at packages that had behaviors indicative of malicious behavior, we, we noticed these primarily because they had some obfuscation uh, within the open source NPM packages. That's Ashley Benj, Director of Threat Intelligence Advocacy at Reversing Labs. The research we're discussing today is titled Operation Brain Leeches, Malicious NPM Packages Fuel Supply Chain and Phishing Attacks. Anytime we see obfuscation of any kind, it's usually a good tell that something's uh, not what it seems. And for folks who may not be uh, familiar, NPM is a popular open source repository? It is, yep. Well, let's go through this together here. I mean, you you see some red flags and, and you and your colleagues start digging into this. What uh, what was the process here? Yeah, so we, we look through uh, this open source library and we find that actually it's not just the, the one malicious package, uh, but it's actually quite a few. Found 13 in total and we've actually grouped them into two sort of main groups uh, with with similar but but different intentions. You know, it, it's common uh, when we analyze these things, in this case, this was JavaScript, if there's obfuscation, we work to deobfuscate that. And then as we work through the code, try to, to pivot through all of our possible angles to see, you know, what is this, what is this uh, package? What is it trying to do? Is it doing what it says it's doing? And in this case, spoofing the name of a very popular open source package. And so again, like the, the um, obfuscation within the package. That's another good indication that this is probably malicious. Uh, in this case, what we actually found is that uh, within this package, uh, I was actually that NPM was being used to host phishing infrastructure, which is quite novel, something that we haven't seen before, despite doing quite a lot of work in this space. Well, let's dig into each of these. As you said, there, there are two sort of clusters that you all categorized here. The the first one was for phishing campaigns? It was. Yeah, this uh, in the first group, what we saw was that the, the packages were being used to host files that were leveraged in phishing campaigns. And actually, the, the phishing kit that was used in this case was probably just purchased and used without any sort of modification. And so the, the flow of an attack that would use this phishing kit would... First, there would be a lure. Someone would receive an email would have a malicious attachment, then instead of going out and calling to attacker-owned uh, infrastructure or a domain that looks potentially suspicious, what would actually happen is that malicious email attachment would, it, it contained a reference to the NPM package, and it actually would reach out to a JavaScript file that would was hosted within that, that package on NPM. And so we, we see first one malicious file fetched, and then a second malicious file is fetched. And finally, the phishing landing page is actually displayed to the user. Uh, in that case, the, the attack is pretty similar. You know, it's phishing for Microsoft 365 credentials. It's pretty pretty common for phishing kits. 
But the, the infrastructure being hosted on NPM was, was quite interesting because we haven't seen that before. And what about the second uh, cluster here? They, they were targeting a, a different group? They were. It, it was interesting. Um, the second group could also potentially be leveraged against the end users of an application that use those open source packages. And so they, they contained the same phishing functionality, uh, but actually it was such that if the, the second group of packages were to be used in an application, probably by a developer who didn't realize that they were using something malicious rather than uh, the actual benign and, and very commonly used package, then that benign code that the developer is writing as it was um, compiled and sent to the end user, that compiled code could actually exhibit the same malicious behavior as the the phishing campaign that we saw that started with that uh, malicious email attachment. And so that's quite interesting because the the threat actor in that case has made the developer sort of the unwilling participant in their campaign. And and what was this second cluster of functionality targeting specifically here? Yeah, that we we don't know quite for sure um, if they had any specific target in mind. But it's interesting to us that that there's the optionality. You know, you have um, the ability to stage a sort of a common and regular phishing attack where the the infrastructure could be hosted on npm, and the the attack path that I mentioned earlier with the first group could still be used, or you know, if that doesn't work, there's also the option that that maybe a developer who isn't uh, paying the, the most attention or happens to make a really unfortunate mistake uh, actually uses that in some um, some code that's being sent out to either their customers or their organization wherever it's being used. And so we, we don't have any victim information, unfortunately, in this case to know if that were um, a, a scenario that happened or, or if it was just a a possibility. Uh, but it's interesting that there was the, the two optionalities as sort of a, a backup plan. The start of the year is a great time to take that next step in your education, career, and beyond. Rely on N2K certification prep to provide the tools to help boost knowledge, skills, and confidence to get you there. And now for a limited time, all N2K certification practice tests are 40% off. Visit n2k.com slash certify and use promo code N2KVDAY. That's N2KVDAY to save 40% on your purchase. That's n2k.com slash certify with promo code N2KVDAY. Offer ends Monday, February 19th. Happy learning. And now a word from our sponsor, Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense provides award-winning cloud-based automated endpoint and vulnerability management solutions to streamline IT and security operations. With its advanced platform, businesses gain complete visibility and control over their infrastructure, reducing IT and security risks and optimizing operational efficiency. With Sixth Sense, you'll get real-time alerts, risk-based vulnerability prioritization and remediations, and an intuitive automation and orchestration engine so you can focus on your core business goals, confident in the knowledge that your enterprise is secure, compliant, and running smoothly. Visit SixthSense.com to learn why enterprises choose them. So Ashley, help me understand here, just just so I'm clear. I mean, is the is the notion that um, a developer is working on whatever project they're working on, and they know that there's a certain open source project they want to make use of, so they go and they search for that on on this uh, repository. They find what they think is that open source thing that they're looking for. They download this malicious code, and then they put that in their project. Would their project function the way that they had hoped it would? Does the does the code do the thing it's supposed to do, but then have this extra stuff off to the side? Yes, that's correct. So oftentimes it, it, it can vary um, depending on the sophistication of the actor behind it. But oftentimes these malicious repositories that are mimicking the benign repositories or packages rather, they actually just copy the existing functionality of the the one that's being spoofed. And so... Yes, it will do uh, what what you think it's going to do, but there's the unfortunate addition of malicious behavior that's probably not what you expected. 
And then what triggers the malicious behavior? Is it, or is it a command and control or is it, is it random? How, how do they go about that part of it? So in the, in the case of the malicious email attachment, uh, it, it would function, you know, just as a regular attack would uh, in a fish, case of phishing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you would have to open this attachment. The functionality actually within the, the first file uh, would go out and fetch a, another malicious file, which would then go fetch another malicious file. And ultimately that uh, file displays the, the landing page. And the landing pages in this case were a bit interesting. You had two options. One is just sort of a basic login. The other is actually a blurred document that would hopefully entice someone, the victim, to to put in credentials to view the unblurred document. So that's sort of a commonplace phishing. Um, that that's not something that's particularly novel or new. But in the second case, what we actually see is that within the um, the group of packages, the malicious content is actually contained within an eval statement. And that eval is obfuscated so that the behavior is is not super obvious. But if that malicious package were to be used in a supposedly benign application, then you would have this this malicious eval sort of coming along for the ride. And so as you you compile this code to get to your final product, you have what you're trying to do. But also, unfortunately, you have what the attacker is trying to do as well, uh, which is to actually go in and display uh, a phishing landing page to the end user. Now, you, you all are using the name Operation Brain Leeches here. Is, is this uh, a new group or is this related to, to things that you have found in the past? So in this case, the, the Brain Leech's name comes from uh, the name of a domain where the um, threat actor was actually sending the, the spoof credentials. But we have seen some similarities. Um, in the case of the similar historic research that we did, we actually saw that a supply chain attack ultimately pivoted over to a similar kind of phishing activity. And that was um, a campaign we called iConverse. But ultimately, uh, that was sort of a, a phishing group, a phishing campaign for a different set of credentials, actually for a um, massive online multiplayer game called PUBG. And so, you know, there, there are some similarities, and it's not the first time we've ever seen the grouping of these phishing attacks with what's likely a supply chain attack. Uh, but we we haven't seen any kind of open source uh, package manager or repository used for actually hosting infrastructure. And so... This is uh, probably not the same group, but it is interesting that we've seen this sort of evolution of of leveraging these open source um, attack vectors. Yeah. Do you have any sense for how successful this campaign has been? So we know that these packages were downloaded about a thousand times. Uh, that doesn't unfortunately give us much indication of success. Uh, we unfortunately don't have any indication of if they were able to successfully harvest credentials. Um, but but they were downloaded. And so at, at that volume, I would expect that it's probably not just testing activity. There was probably at least uh, some attempt uh, to to display that landing page and likely get credentials out of it. Yeah. What are your recommendations then? I mean, it, it seems like there are two groups uh, in play here. There's the, the, there's the phishing side of it, but then the developers as well. Any words of wisdom here for folks to protect themselves? Yeah, it's tough. This is a, a tough area to detect. Uh, on the phishing side, it's it's tough to sort of do the usual detection strategies where you might block suspicious domains because this is not actually a suspicious domain, right? It, it's calling out to, to NPM and, and that's not really something you can block because probably uh, your organization is is using it in some benign way. Mm. So on the, on the end user uh space, it's it's probably going to be the actual contents of that lore file within the email. And so, you know, there wasn't anything particularly novel in the lore or anything of, of that nature. And so the, the common phishing detection strategies still apply. But in the case of the supply chain threat, that is actually a little bit more difficult, I think, because to really see the malicious behavior, the, the usual AppSec uh, detection strategies are... are not things that are necessarily going to help you in this case. To be able to detect something like this, what you're really going to need is a tool that can inspect uh, the actual contents of the compiled final package and understand that behavior. So before 
you as a developer ship that out to your, your end user, you're going to want to take a look at that final build and make sure that it's only displaying the behavior that, that you want to display uh, and, and not anything else. And in this case, that your, your application isn't actually displaying a phishing landing page. Uh, and so if that's not something your current security stack does, uh, it's probably something that you should, uh, should address. And, and there are solutions out there that can help you analyze that, that final package's behavior. Now, you point out in the research that um, obfuscated code is a, is a big red flag here. I'm curious, you know, your typical developer who's out here making use of these open source packages, do they typically use them kind of plug and play, you know, like, like Lego bricks in their project? Um, or do they go in and, and look at the code with any sort of scrutiny to, to look for things like obfuscation? Yeah, I, I can't speak for the entire development community, but I have right. to say for my <laughs> own self, I'm very guilty of just plugging and playing and not really stopping to consider uh, whether or not I, I, I've made a mistake and maybe I've made a typo that I don't catch or, or maybe there's been uh, something added to a package that, that I'm just not aware of. And so I think a lot of that comes from the pressure on developers to move quickly and to release code quickly. And in a world where we're increasingly reliant on software and our everyday lives, you know, it becomes very tough to have your, your development team who probably already has limited time and resources really take a, a look at a, every single open source package that they're using. So that's again, where the, the detection strategies sort of come where it, it's very valuable to automate this however you can and take right. a look at your final build before you actually release it. So your poor developer doesn't have to go through and, and read all of the open source code that he's include, he or she is including in uh, their final package. Our thanks to Ashley Bench from Reversing Labs for joining us. The research is titled Operation Brain Leeches, Malicious NPM Packages Fuel Supply Chain and Phishing Attacks. We'll have a link in the show notes. And now a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. The CyberWire Research Saturday podcast is a production of N2K Networks, proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Elliot Peltzman. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.